Hi, I'm Deanna Joe, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Jeff Mayo, and he is going to share his story of leaving the UPC, his time in the United Pentecostal Church, and just kind of the spiritual journey he's been on over the last, well, few few decades, really. And <laughs> I'll tell you up front, I did not sleep well last night. I have been tired and foggy all day. And we got, how far would you say, Jeff? How far did we get into this? It must have been 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> At least. And I realized I forgot to press record. So we had to start over again. And so here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Yeah. Back at the beginning again, and um, I guess we'll just start over. Yeah, that's all <laughs> And right. I will say, welcome, Jeff. <laughs> again. <laughs> it's really great to have you join me, and let's just jump right into it. And I will okay. ask you how you got into the UPC. Were you born in, joined in, dragged in? <laughs> <laughs> whatever yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah well like i said a moment ago when when we forgot to record i was not dragged in although it <laughs> felt like that at times <laughs> wasn't dragged in um for me it went like it went like this um my mother is the youngest of three daughters and her dad um i can you know and i don't want to leave my grandmother out too because she obviously played a big role in our lives but She's the youngest of three daughters, and they were in the ministry, and they got involved in it before there was a UPC. And somewhere in my closet, I have my my papa's ordination papers, and it was signed by the the first uh, UPC general superintendent, which I think was Stanley Chambers. So, so they went way back, and I my grandparents were were solid Christian people. And there's no doubt in my mind that they love Jesus. They love God with all their heart. And their lifestyle uh, was a testimony of that. You know, very kind, very loving people. And how that, how I got involved was uh, my parents divorced when I was three or four. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a clean divorce. It was, there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of um, hard feelings and things like that. And I've heard, my dad's story, my dad's side of the story, and my mom's side of the story of it. And, um, you know, it, with, I, I'm not an expert on marriage and relationships, but sometimes it's just not going to work. And with him, it didn't. And they tried to protect me from all the fallout of it. But as a, as a kid, when you see your parents split up, it, it still hurts, you know. And, and that, for, for many years, was, was a hurt on my heart that my parents couldn't get along with each other and they both remarried and my mom remarried uh and i have two half sisters i'm we are nine and seven years apart but at age 13 um things were happening in in the home that again i won't get all into here but i was i was distraught and unhappy and uh we lived in this suburb of denver called aurora and you know, at at this point in time, Aurora and history, Aurora and Denver are so close together. You you know, you can drive and you kind of can't tell when when Denver ends and Aurora begins in some places. So anyway, um, my dad lived about seven miles from us, and I had plotted this this and hatched this scheme for months that I wanted to run away and be with my dad because um, I only saw him on weekends and sometimes every other weekend, and I missed him so much. So I did, and I, you know, had it all planned out, and, and surprisingly, it went mostly according to plan, at least the runaway part did, and I got on my little BMX bike and rode it seven miles to his house, which for me just seemed like the journey of a lifetime, <laughs> I'm sure. but, you know, but I got there, and, um, you know, my my mom wound up not letting me stay, but it sent a message to her, I remember, that I was very unhappy, and her and my stepdad ran a a business at the time. He had a cable TV business um, in the in the early up to the late eighties, maybe early nineties. That was before all the big uh, cable TV conglomerates came and absorbed everything. But he was he had a knack for bringing cable TV to to rural communities and stuff. And, 
and for several years had a quite a thriving business in that. But I would, you know, I'd get a ride. My mom would would find ladies. I don't know how she'd find it, but she'd find ladies at the school I went to that would drop me off at her office, at their office. And so, I, you know, this was about a month after I ran away. And I went in there one day and my mom called me into her private office and she closed the door. And I don't remember all the conversation, but she expressed to me that she knew I was unhappy uh, because I had run away. And she said, you know, there's some things that if you want to live with your dad, that I want him to get an order first before you do that. And that could take a while. She said, or you can go live with your grandparents. You can go live with Granny and Papa. And I was so miserable and hurt at that time in my life. I just wanted to leave. I just wanted to get out. So it wasn't a hard decision to go and live with my grandparents. And so with it was a very short amount of time before I was packing my suitcase. And they lived in Amarillo, Texas at that time. This was 1984. And my, my papa was the assistant pastor to the to the lead pastor there in that church in Amarillo. And my stepdad was Catholic, so we had only gone to to Catholic church. And the difference between the, you know, the traditional Roman Catholic church and the Pentecostals, it's it's another (laughs) planet. (laughs) And, you know, you see all this, all this emotional demonstrative worship that, you know, um, I had said to you, Deanna, that it, I don't think it's all bad, but some of it gets kind of crazy. And yeah. we're so far out, out of it now that, you know, some of it we look at it like, wow, I mean, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because I had mentioned about the guy who beat the pulpit to pieces with the hammer. Yeah, I saw that <laughs> video out there circulating. So a little demonstration's not a bad thing, but you can go too far. Yeah. And, you know, um, we went the first Sunday I was there. Obviously, we go to church and um, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And I think it was the Sunday night service that um, that whatever the pastor spoke about, um, I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life at 13 years old. And I didn't know what it was. But at the end of it, I just, you know, they're, they're giving the altar call, the invitation. And I just I'm grabbing onto the pew in front of me and my knuckles are turning white <laughs> and and my granny leans over and she whispers in my ear, she says, Jeff, would you like to go up to the front? And I'm just like, well, yeah. I mean, what do I do? <laughs> and yeah. she says, well, yeah, you just you just go up there and talk to the Lord. And and I did. And when you've never been around it at all, you can't process what's going on. You just know that God is dealing with you. Yeah. And, you know, I, all these years later, I, you know, I, I, I see God deal with people in all kinds of churches. I mean, God dealt with people in Billy Graham crusades. I mean, oh, yeah. when, when God's ready to convict someone, you know, you you feel it, you sense it. Yeah. So I went and, uh, you know, and prayed and nobody really prayed with me at that point. But I'm just like, yeah, I'm up at the front. Of, this is a this is a good thing that you're supposed to do. <laughs> and they had a Christian school there, and my papa, besides being the assistant pastor, he was a very busy man. He was also the principal of that Christian school. And so I, they would have chapel services three times a week, and at one of the chapel services, this same pastor uh, preached to us. And at the end of it, they give the altar call, the invitation, you know, and and everyone's coming up to the front. And, you know, I'm new to all this, people raising their hands up and you know, and, and I go up there and it just, it just felt so good. I felt so loved. Um, and, and I, you know, no doubt that was God touching me. You know, I, I don't dispute that one bit. And I remember after a few moments, you know, they hit my, my papa and granny had talked to me a little bit about the, the speaking in tongues things, but not much. And I, I certainly didn't understand it. But my papa whispers in my ear at one point, he said, Jeff, he said, you may hear words going through your mind. And he said, you know, if you do, he says, even if it doesn't make sense, just speak those words. And I don't recall, I mean, I'm 52 now, this is, you know, almost 40 years ago, but I just kind of trusted him because this is my papa, this is my my grandfather, he's a minister, I, you know, I can trust him. And I mean, I, I did 
I guess, speak in tongues a little bit. And to this day, I'm not sure if I was coached by him or if it actually happened. And, you know, I'm not casting doubt on the experience. I just don't know. And, yeah. You know, when you're 40 years away from it, it's hard to remember. It all is. My details. Yeah. But I remember I just kept leaning backwards, leaning backwards. And um, <laughs> someone was behind me catching me. And, you know, they they told me I was at a 45 degree angle at one point and they just gently lowered me to the floor. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just on the floor, raising my hands up, trying, like I'm trying to reach out to God. And, yeah, you know, so there's all this talk about that. Hey, you got the Holy ghost and okay. You know, I'm, I'm all right with that. Uh, looking back on it, I, I do believe that I put faith in Jesus and, and was mm -hmm. filled with his spirit and whether or not I was coached to speak in tongues, that's a little gray for me, you know, and, and, and at this point it's not really that important. Right. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, you and me have, have studied a lot about this and I, I'm familiar with some of your journey. And yes, when you put faith in Jesus, you are filled with the spirit. That's yes, all that. over the New Testament. Yeah. And, I will say that I have met many Christians over the last six years that have never spoken in tongues. Yes. But you see the fruit of the spirit manifest in their life. Absolutely. You know? And, yeah. and some, you know, not putting anybody down, but some of these that I've met even more so than some of the Pentecostals. I knew. And yeah. Oh, I agree. Not, and it's not of them. And it's not just, oh, they're self-disciplined and stuff. No, you you can't make these kind of changes and manifest this kind of love unless God is in your heart. You just, I'm convinced you can't. But back to what I, I was I was talking about. Um, when I got home after that day in school, um, my, my papa went through the instances in the book of Acts where where this happens and, and where tongues happens. And, you know, we know it's, it's pretty much Acts chapter 2, 10 and 19. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and you know, and he talked to me about getting baptized and why we need to get baptized in, in Jesus' name and all this. And I didn't really understand it. I'm just trusting my papa. Yeah. And I tried to understand it, but with my 13-year-old mind, I mean, we're looking at the King James Bible and he just he would ask me, Do you understand? And I'd just nod my head because <laughs> yep. I, didn't to, I didn't want to say I didn't understand, but yeah. I tried. You know, and I was so starved to be loved at that point. And, you know, God has shown me, again, the past six years that there was, you know, just such a lack of, of love in my life. And I wanted that. And it's like when they explained in church what had happened, it was kind of like, well, OK, I got baptized and I spoke in tongues. So now I'm part of the club. Yeah. And, you know, and it just, it felt good to feel like for once in my life that I'm accepted and I'm in and not mm -hmm. out and didn't understand that, you know, and I'd, I'd get excited too. And, you know, it was, it was great at 13 years old where, you know, I was a fast runner, so I could run, <laughs> I could run like six or seven laps around the church. <laughs> and we had one, one little view that stuck out at the end and I'd, I'd hurdle over that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, you, the, all, you have this experience, but you're still a 13 year old boy, right? And you're still going to act like a 13 year old boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I like doing the things that that 13 year old boys like to do. I mean, you know, I like to like to get in wrestling matches after school and and jump my bike off the curbs of yeah of driveways like it's a ramp and things like that. You know, and play with GI Joes and and all of that, um, you know, and, and at that age, you're you're a teenager and you're going to get rebellious anyway. You know, I discovered rock music at the time and that was the that was the coolest thing ever. But I wasn't allowed <laughs> to listen to rock music. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. So uh, after a few years, things changed and my grandparents wanted to move back to Denver. And I guess I was about 17 at the time. And. All I can say is I didn't want to be back around what I had left. Mm -hmm. And my dad, when I moved to Texas, he was still working for the government, working for the Air Force and civil service up here. 
and they offered him a job in Sacramento, which is north of where I live in California now. And, you know, my, my dad took the job. So dad was in California now. You know, he was no longer in Colorado, and I I was unable to see him. And so at, at 17, you know, it was kind of just almost the same pattern as when I was 13. I was unhappy. I didn't want to be there. And got in this big argument one time with, with my mom and stepdad. And, and to make a long story short, I said, you know, if if you don't let me go live with my dad now, the day I turn 18 in April, I'm just going to pack up my car. I'm going to drive to California. And, you know, and they didn't like hearing that, but, you know, they, they knew I meant what I said. So they, they let me go. And I had, you know, I had been living with my grandparents, but it was, but in Colorado too, but my mom and stepdad were just on the other side of town. So, you know, we were always around each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I never got to be around my dad and I wanted to know who he was. I wanted to have the experience of of living with him and being around him. So at 17, they let me go and moved to Sacramento. And um, I went from having all these restrictions and, and rules to my dad who didn't have any rules or restrictions. Well, and you you said you went to the Christian school too. So you would have went yeah. from Christian school to public school. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and that was that was challenging. And and especially when all you've been in up to age 17 is Christian schools. Mm. It's it's way different. Yeah, I'm sure. And my dad from his second marriage, his wife had had passed away in a very unfortunate manner, but he was he was still in connect in connection with with her daughters and especially the youngest one. And at, at one point, she still lived with him. She was maybe a year older than me, I think. So I start talking to her, and and she's a different person now too. She's not Christian, but but she had some bad habits. She was you know smoking a lot of weed, experimenting with drugs and stuff, and she had these boyfriends that that I thought were really cool guys, and, <laughs> you know, and and they're course they're very bad influences and like I said my dad really didn't have as many restrictions and his thing was hey as long as you know if you're gonna go somewhere just tell me where you're at Mm -hmm. so don't worry about him but other than that there there really wasn't much restriction and you know he didn't want me smoking pot he didn't want me experimenting with drugs and I would lie to him and say I wasn't but but I was (laughs) and you know thank god I didn't plunge into it uh, at that time in my life, being 17, 18 years old, but I was experimenting with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, and things I shouldn't have been. And um, this went on for a few years, after, even after I graduated high school. And by then I had made my own friends. And, you know, my stepsister didn't have to introduce me to people anymore. I was I was finding enough trouble on my own. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I had this moment when I was about 20 and I thought, man, you know, looking back on on things I had learned in my early experiences in Pentecost and Christianity, I, I, I knew it was wrong. You know, even if I didn't have the church, you know, everybody is telling me and, and just society in, in general, the mainstream of society is telling you this is not the way you need to live your life because yeah. it's destructive and it's harmful, you yeah. know, and I had this moment where I thought, you know, I, I don't want to keep doing this. I, I don't want to go to hell and I need to stop. And the thing was, I wanted to come back to God, but the only God I knew was the God that the UPC presented. And, you know, and I'll get into more of this as we, as we continue the interview, but, you know, they make you feel like there is no other place to go. Right. So, you know, back then, didn't have the internet, but I I grabbed a copy of the Yellow Pages, and I looked up churches, and I just, I found this UPC church in Sacramento that, uh, you know, that was a few miles away, and I told my dad one night, I'm going to church, and my dad looked surprised, because he he (laughs) knew how I was living. I mean, I was, you know, I was playing guitar all the time in a a little heavy metal band, (laughs) and, you know, and and doing drugs and partying and stuff. And my dad was kind of surprised and happy. He says, well, what church are you going to go to? And I told him it was a Pentecostal church. He goes, oh, 
He goes, well, your grandparents will be happy about that. <laughs> he said, you should call them. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I should, you know, and, and I go there and, you know, it was the same type of experiences I had at 13, but, but now I'm looking at it at a 20 in a 20 year old mind. Right. And I went there wanting it to feel the same as mm-hmm. it did at 13 and it didn't. And rather than chasing God, I was chasing that feeling those emotions that I remembered at 13. Okay. Yeah. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, you know? it does. And they weren't there. And I thought, man, I what did I do wrong? You know, and I and I came home and I thought, well, I just maybe I just need to try harder. Mm-hmm. And then I'll feel these experiences again. You know, then I'll what do you think the- you were hoping to feel? Do you think it was like excitement or do you think it was more like peace? Yeah, some of the excitement and the joy and, yeah. the, you know, just that feeling of just overwhelming joy and, and being loved from God. Yeah. Um, and I would go to this church and and they would be jumping around and, and people be dancing around. And at that age, I would do it when I'd go to the church services, but I wasn't feeling anything in the inside. Mm-hmm. And. I didn't know how to express it, but looking back, I thought, well, if I participate in this, in this demonstrative worship, if I go to the front of the church and I raise my hands and jump up and down, like I see this brother over here doing, right? then maybe I'll get some of what he has. Right. Yeah. And I didn't. And it was so confusing. And I, I was just looking for that, that same experience, I guess that same high, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I and I couldn't find it. And I acted like I could, but I couldn't. And so, yeah, like my dad suggested, I did call my granny and papa. And they're just so thrilled. Oh, I'm God. sure. We thought, we thought you were gone for good, Jeff. We thought you were lost mm-hmm. forever. Now you came back, you know. And so me and my dad, um, I talked to him, and he was able to take some time off. And we drove up there to visit him. And initially, it was just going to be a visit. I was going to drive up there and come back. And I wanted this experience so bad, like I just shared with you, that at some point, I I think I talked to my granny and I asked her, I said, if I wanted to stay with you and not go back with my dad, would you let me? And I remember her saying something like, well, I'll talk to Papa about it. But she said, yeah, I think so. She says, as long as you behave yourself, <laughs> you can stay with me. Yeah, they were getting too old for your foolishness at that point. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, they're, they're in their, their late 70s then. And I thought to myself, you know, okay, I'm going to try as hard as I can. My, that was my thought process. I'm going to try as hard as I can to be the best Christian I can be. Mm-hmm. And whatever they tell me to do, whatever rules they tell me to follow, I'm going to follow them, you know, to to the tenth power, whatever it takes. Yeah. And you know, my dad was a little disappointed that I wasn't going back with him, but you know, he he obviously left the ball in my court. And uh, a few months later, I I made one more plane trip back to California to get the rest of my stuff and moved out there for uh, to Denver for good. And, you know, living with my grandparents. And I did, Deanna. I gave it my best. Yeah. And I gave it my best effort. And I noticed that my papa would get up in the in the wee hours of the morning and he would pray. And I would look at that and, and I'd think, aha, that's that's how you get a hold of God. You know, yeah. Because you, get, you wake up at 5 a.m. and you start praying. And so I would do that. And I wouldn't pray talking to God for myself, or how would I say this, the way that Jeff would talk to God, I would try to pray in the same manner as my papa did. Right. And that was, looking back, I can say that was his relationship with God. Mm -hmm. He approached God. And, you know, God wasn't asking me to parrot and imitate him. He's just asking me to be my authentic self and be Jeff. Right. And I didn't get that. And I thought, man, what is wrong? I'm trying so hard. And, you know, whatever the church said to do, I did. Um, you know, you'd, I'd, you'd go to these 
a Saturday morning outreach, you know, and you'd hear things like, well, God's not moving in your life because you're not witnessing enough. And well, you know, I want God to move in my life. So I guess I better witness more. Right. And I'd go and knock on doors and, you know, even in the cold weather. And, you know, uh, <laughs> I think now at 52, I think that's one of the worst methods of it. <laughs> I was going to say, knock on doors <laughs> and make a pest out of yourself with people yeah. try to enjoy their weekend off. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't feel like that's a good way to reach people all these years later. But, probably not. you know, I knocked on one lady's door one time and she, <laughs> some people wouldn't even answer the door. <laughs> but she this this lady like in her 60s comes to the door and i said hi i'm jeff from such and such a church and i'd like to invite you to church this sunday and she says and you just got me out of a sick bed and, oh. bam, and, she <laughs> the door. and, Guess and i felt like i was this big <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and you know not knowing any better you're like well you know i guess this is what persecution's like but, oh yeah you're the <laughs> martyr <laughs> <laughs> not realizing that not, that I might have been a little obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> this poor lady sick. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I I did that, and about a year and a half into it, you know, I and I still question this. I I started thinking that that I was called to the ministry, that I was called to preach. Mm -hmm. When I look at it now, I'm not saying I wasn't or or even that I'm not, but I'm thinking that I would look to the ministry and I would think here these are the guys that are the closest to God. Yes. And 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 see the theme here, like I've been saying, is I just wanted to be close to God. Right. You wanted to be close to God and you figured the way you would know that is if you felt the feeling that you felt back when you were younger. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you got it. And I I didn't see that then, you know, and I kept chasing after this experience and, and never finding it and mm -hmm. never finding peace with God, never finding any assurance. It was it was, um, you know, I've come up with a few terms my on my own the last six years, and I, I call it the gospel of anxiety. Yeah. Well, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and in UPC circles, they do elevate the ministry. There's a big clergy laity divide where the clergy is way up here and the average saint mm -hmm. is way down here. And so it makes perfect sense. And I think a lot of young men feel called to the ministry. Like I rarely talk to a young man who was in UPC circles who at some point didn't wonder whether it be through the fear of being afraid that he, he might not do the will of the Lord. And so he's worried and, and wanting to follow it or, or if it's just a matter of just loving the Lord and wanting to do everything you can for God and, and thinking, well, if I can offer myself up to, to anything I will. And so thinking, well, maybe God is calling me to the ministry and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll do that. And so I think it's, I think it's pretty common. Okay. I, that's interesting. I'd, yeah, I'd love to talk with you more about that at a different time. Yeah, yeah. It makes perfect sense, you know. Um, and, you know, I I was, the church I was involved in, you know, the theory was, and, and I think in a lot of UPC churches, you know, they're not just going to put you up behind the pulpit. No. You know, you're you're going to have to prove yourself somehow. Mm -hmm. okay. We had a... Well, unless a, you're the preacher's son. That's true too. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. There's going to be preachers I, I went to, listening to this that are going to be like, "I don't." I like went it. to a Bible college, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, I, I saw I saw a few of those in Bible college. Well, unless you're the preacher's son, or you married the pastor's daughter, right? Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of folks that that marry the pastor's daughter wind up being ministers. You you hardly ever see it happen where <laughs> marries the pastor's daughter and it's not a minister, right? It tends to fall into their lap. Yeah. 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 But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So back to, back to my story. Um, so we had a group on Sunday afternoons that would go to uh, one of the nursing homes in Denver mm -hmm. and we would speak to them. And so those were my first experiences preaching, 
was, was, was preaching to, you know, these poor elderly people in a nursing home. And, you know, it, looking at it now, I mean, that's great. That's a great thing to do to go to a nursing home. But I mean, I think instead of, of preaching at these people, it would be better to befriend them. Yeah. Show the love of Christ to them, you know, show them, them. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to what they have to say, you know, care about them. And that, that's what Jesus would do. Right. And that's yeah. what they need. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so I would, I would prepare these elaborate sermons and, <laughs> You know, and these these poor elderly people are, you know, some of them are falling asleep on you. And, <laughs> and here you're just trying to help them with their sinful lives. <laughs> They're in the nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. And uh, and and one lady, um, when it was done, she told me I was boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Old people, they can uh, they just come right out with it. They're like little kids. The filter's gone. <laughs> That, she said, well, that guy was boring, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, it hurt my feelings. I'm 21 years old and this old lady called <laughs> <Yeah>. boring. <laughs> oh. But, but yeah, and we, we did have one lady that, um, that finally did come with us from that. Uh, she had diabetes real bad and had kind of lost everything. And, and, and she did come to come uh, to church with us for a, a certain period of time until she passed okay. away. Yeah. You know, so somehow, you know, God used our mess to reach her. <laughs> <laughs> he can um, use anything, can he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, and finally I was allowed to, to preach out at a couple of different churches. Um, one of the other ministers in the church uh, would go out and preach with him. And he was kind of like my chaperone, you know, mm-hmm. He would preach a little bit. I'd preach a little bit and um, wound up going to Bible college, finally out, out in the city I live in now in, in Stockton, California in 1993, in the fall of 1993. And you told me you had family members that. Uh, yeah, I did right around then. And I graduated in 94. Okay. So <laughs> I I would have, I didn't go there. I went to a Bible college here, but it was just a few years later. So okay. we were all blessed in the Bible colleges with our presence right around the same time. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I get out here and man, you know, I'm, I'm 22 years old at the time. And yeah, you know, you're going to be on fire for God and, and change the world and be the next conference preacher. For sure. And, <laughs> and, um, so much I didn't understand about the scriptures, even at that time. And when I began to see some of the holes in what I believe, what I believed in my core beliefs and, and things that I want to say that the UPC said they believed, but didn't, but it seemed like they didn't really believe mm-hmm. as far as grace, as far as mercy. Yeah. And, You know, I want to talk about this today, too. There's so much performance based acceptance is the term that I that I heard a few years ago um, in these denominations like this. And it's in the UPC and it's not just the UPC. There's you know, I've learned that there's other others out there that, you know, that have that same problem. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Your acceptance is based on how much you perform, how much you do. Yeah. Um. The problem is you can never do enough, you know, and if you're trying to earn your way with God, if you're trying to to merit grace, you're never going to. No. You're never going to. And you learn at some point that this grace that you want so bad that you already have it. Yes. But I didn't see that. And what started to change it for me was that freshman year after I would do all the homework, I'd try to. <clears throat> I'd try to have my own devotion time. And I was reading uh, something out of, I'm, I'm rusty on the location in the scripture, but I think it's Matthew chapter nine. But this is where, where God just kind of opened it up for me and it, and it began to change. I began to see the light uh, that it's after Jesus meets Matthew and he goes to his house to have dinner. And the Pharisee is criticizing 
as they always did, they say to the disciples, well, well, here's your teacher eating with publicans and sinners. And Jesus overhears that. And he says, you know, he says, if, if you knew what this means, he says, go in. He says that I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And he tells them to go and learn that. He says, go learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus says, if you if you can get your minds around this concept, you'll stop condemning people. And I, those words, it was almost like it was another language, you know, like they say it was, I could have been reading Greek off the page. I didn't at the time understand what it meant. And I prayed as I'm pacing back and forth in my dorm room, God, show me what this, what this means, because I don't even understand what this says. And a couple chapters later, it talks about the disciples are walking th- and Jesus are walking through uh, a grain field. And it says the disciples are so hungry, they start picking off little flecks of grain and eating them. And it happens to be on the Sabbath. And the same Pharisees come and nitpick at them again. And they said, hey, your disciples are eating on the Sabbath. <laughs> and, you know, and Jesus isn't so concerned about that because his response, he says, well, did you ever read when David went into the mm-hmm. temple and ate the showbread that he wasn't supposed to eat. Yeah. You know, David wasn't supposed to do that and God didn't strike him dead, but the poor Jesus paraphrasing again, but Jesus saying the poor guy's hungry and he, Jesus reminds him, he said, if you had learned what I told you that I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Mm. And Jesus says they're guiltless. And he's quoting out of Hosea chapter six. But the idea that I that I started to get, and, and it was like God turned the light on for me right then about this concept that God wasn't so much interested in my sacrifice as he was giving me his mercy. And I saw that, and it was like, Deanna, in that moment, this, this thing I've been sharing with you of, of wanting to feel this experience and this love and acceptance with God, when I understood that concept about mercy and not sacrifice— it just it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I remember I, I, I set my Bible down on a shelf and I just thought, wow, God, does this does this mean what I think it means? Mm-hmm. And it did. And it was about mercy. And I'm thinking, why don't we teach things like this? How come nobody's ever preached a sermon about mercy and not sacrifice? You know, because all the things I hear is about how much you're not doing and you need to be more and you need to give more and you need to do more. And people are running themselves to death in this organization, doing everything they can and and uh, performing. Yeah. And they don't feel like it's enough. Well, because it's never enough. Right. And And we don't have to make that sacrifice to get righteous because Christ made it for us. Mm hmm. And I started to see that, and I thought, you know, okay, this is this is new, this is different, but it's in the Word, and nobody talks about this. And my whole paradigm, I guess, as they say, started to shift. And I, I retained that for a while, but you're immersed in this Bible college. You're immersed in, in the same idea of performance. Yeah, it's a culture. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, and I got, I got so frustrated by that, and at times confused because I'm like, well, the word says this, but they're also saying all this stuff, and you know, people would throw James chapter two at you, you know, it's faith without works is dead, and you know, God showed me that eventually what all, what all that meant, and to simplify that, James is not saying what what Christians do to be saved. He's saying what saved people do. Right. Exactly. (laughs) True faith produces works. It's just, it can't help it. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a condemning thing. He's just saying, this is, this is Mm -hmm. kind of a litmus test that says your faith is genuine. You know, it's a changed life, but didn't get all that at the time. And I just got so frustrated you know, and burned out because I was seeing one thing, but like you said, I was immersed in the other. Right. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't do it. I just dropped out. I was done because, you know, I'm, I'm torn between what I had learned here and, and what I felt like was expected of me. And it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It was just such confusion. Right. 
And so I, I dropped out after the second year and, you know, my, my family was, my Pentecostal family is very disappointed in everything. Um, my dad tried to understand. I think he understood more than anybody, but he didn't know what to do to help me. And, you know, I, after a year out of Bible college, I tried to go back to Denver again. Um, and I felt so bad. I felt like I had failed mm -hmm. so badly in Bible college that somehow I wanted to make it up and make it right. And again, I, you know, still some of the old confusion is there where I think I have to do more to make up for it. Right. Rather than understanding that, you know, even if, even if the idea that I just totally failed and blew it was true, and in some aspects it was, that God was willing to forgive me mm. and, and love me as much as he ever did. But any time I would bring that up, to a, to a minister, an elder, there was always something more I had to do. And I couldn't take it. And, you know, I go back, to, I go, go to Denver in 1996. I come back out here again in 1997. And I was just, I was just through with it. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I felt like I was supposed to do, I guess. Um, it, was, it was never enough. You felt like no matter what you did, it was never enough. So it's yeah. it's defeating the whole oh. yeah and and i was so confused and, and conflicted in myself and there was no place to go and you know i was thinking about things i would say in this interview today uh early this morning and you know i wish that i would have had the courage to walk into another church a different church yeah of another denomination and explain that this was going on, but you're taught that you can't go anywhere else. Right. You know, and I was coming from a church that, that said, if you know, said things like, if you ever leave this church, you are doomed, you are lost, you know, and you'd hear yeah. things like that. And that's terrifying. Oh, it's extremist thinking. Like I, I've heard people say, I would rather have my loved one drunk on a bar stool then go to a Pentecostal church that wasn't United Pentecostal International. And I just remember, like, I've heard people say crazy things like that. I, I'd rather see my loved one out in sin than to be in a church that doesn't preach this truth. Things like that. And I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And and there was a time I, I probably said things like that, too. Well, and they attach so much fear to the idea of going to any other church that people just leave, period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think sometime in the early 2000s, I was back out here. Um, my dad had moved to Lodi, which is a city about 10 miles to the north of where I'm at in Stockton. Now it's a nice little town. Um, it, it's kind of changing now, but back then, nice little small town, agricultural community, about 60,000 people at the time. And my dad lived there. So I come back out to Lodi and, you know, went to, um, again, went to the big church out here in, in Stockton and uh, sometime in the early 2000s. And, I, I'll never forget again going to one of the ministers in that church after a service, and I, I didn't tell him the whole story, but I, I said something like, "Hey, man, I'm I'm a backslider," and I said, "I, you know, I I need some advice. I need some counsel. Can you help me?" Something like that. And he just looked at me and he said, "Well, man, you know what to do." And he just kind of said that to me and walked off, and I I just felt so deflated and and defeated and i thought no man i don't know what to do it's, <laughs> oh, i'm wow. asking for your help yeah and, and this is all you've got <laughs> and, yeah and so you know ultimately it just became overwhelming and I, I i stayed in that limbo of of can't go back to the upc because i'm miserable there right i can't go anywhere else because i'm scared to death that they're wrong You'll be given over to a reprobate mind and given oh. over to deception. And Oh, man. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had quite a few unproductive years of, of life where I was just wandering around in that limbo. 
and and it it just it kills you as a person because you're not growing at all as a person you're not developing you're just stuck in this in this this space of fear you know Mm -hmm. and you know I, i i would make friends i mean it's it's always been relatively easy for me to make friends with people and I had a couple of good friends at that time that I would explain some of this stuff to and explain some of the beliefs I had to, and they'd say, man, that's just crazy. <laughs> and I, my, my old friend, Jim, who is, you know, he's a, was one of my best friends for 11 years. Um, you know, I was talking to him one night sitting in his car after work, we worked together. And I, and I said, you know, Jim, I said, sometimes I think God is just, is just hunting me down. He's trying to kill me. And he said, really? He said, I've never thought anything like that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just so foreign to his thinking. But that that was how I felt. And back in 2000, January 2000, my dad had this massive stroke, um, just totally debilitated him, changed his life forever. And he only lived a few years after that um, and had a second stroke in a couple of years. And I was taking care of my dad. We we tried to put him in a, a nursing home, care home, and he was in his mid-60s. And I just couldn't stand that when I'd go in to visit him. And you That's know, young. Uh, oh, man, yeah. And, and poor dad didn't take care of himself, just ate horribly and, you know, had smoked a lot of cigarettes for a number of years. So, you know, yeah, I, in a way he did it to himself, but, you know, still he... He's a human being like anybody oh, else. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot to deal with at that age. Like I can't even imagine. Right. And I, I was in my early thirties at the time. And I just thought, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't have any caretaking experience, but I can't leave my dad here. Yeah. I can't leave him in this, in this home, just wait for him to die. So in 2001, You know, he had his retirement income. I was working in between our two incomes. We could live pretty good. Mm -hmm. We got an apartment in the city, Lodi, and I took care of him the best I could. And, you know, I would would sometimes go to a UPC church, sometimes not. I would take him with me, and that was just so hard because he was in a wheelchair and I didn't have any help and, you know, and all of that. And so my granny died in... September of 2004, uh, she had taken a fall and broken her hip and never recovered from that. Oh, she passed yeah. And within a month, my friend Jim, who I mentioned when I was telling you that story about, you know, it felt like God was trying to hunt me down and kill me. Uh, Jim had been my friend for a number of years, one of my closest friends, like like a brother. And I worked in uh, this city to the north of us called Elk Grove outside of Sacramento. And I needed, my dad needed constant supervision and Jim had some, some health problems with his back at the time. And he was willing to stay in our apartment, watch my dad while I'd go to work. And at one point um, he wanted to take a week's vacation to go visit some family of his in Missouri. And so I, I, I said, no, you know what, just go. I said, I've got an hour lunch every day and it takes 20 minutes to get home. So I'll just drive home, check on my dad, make him a sandwich or something and go back to work. And so I did that for a couple of days. And one day, I don't remember what it was. I couldn't make it home. And um, I tried to call my dad and the phone was busy. And um, I thought that was odd because dad never called anybody. But I thought, well, maybe it's an off chance that somebody called him. And I tried again after I got off work. The phone is still busy. And I'm like, you know, something's up. I don't know what, but something's not right. And so I got home and um, had stepped in the door. And as soon as I stepped in the door in the apartment, I saw my dad sitting in his wheelchair and he was, he was passed away. Unfortunately, he had died. Oh. You know, he just, his skin's pale white and everything. And, uh, you know, they said later that he'd been dead about three hours when I found him. Okay. Um, and what had happened was uh, due to the stroke, he couldn't swallow very well mm-hmm. still, you know, and, and that was a thing. You had to watch him eat because he'd sometimes eat too fast and choke on his food. Yeah. And he had just gotten this jar of peanut butter and he was just eating it right out of the jar. Oh, okay. No water or nothing. And he had unfortunately choked to death on peanut butter. Oh. Know? 
and that was rough. I mean, calling nine one one, and you know the the nine one one dispatcher telling me uh, to reach down in his throat and scrape the peanut butter out, and I'm just scraping gobs of this peanut butter out with my dad's body on the floor, and you know after that, I, I think I had hit a breaking point with. Well, that would be so traumatic in and of itself. The right. trauma of that would would have affected you very, very deeply. Exactly. And yeah. you combine that with all of the religious confusion and, and hurt that mm-hmm. I had up to that point, and it was just too much. And at that time, yes, I was very angry at God because I thought, you know, my dad wasn't perfect, but he was a good, kind man. A good person, yeah. And 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 why did he have to die like this? You know. Yeah, that's a fair no, question. Yeah, with no dignity. I mean, you know, and, and and you know, wearing an adult diaper in his in his wheelchair. I mean, you know, no nobody. You you don't. When we think of passing on out of this life, we don't think of dying like that. Right. It's so undignified, and you know, I was angry, and I lost my granny the month before, and um, you know when. When he passed away, he used to tell me, and it's interesting because he had he he had all these problems. You know, he he was he had type two diabetes and everything, and we had to go to this vascular specialist about a week before this happened, and um, in another part of California here, a couple hours away. And when we got back, my dad was just so tired from this. Excuse me, from this car ride. And I helped him get into his bedroom and he said, I just want to take a nap, son. I just want to, I just want to get some rest. And we got in there and I'm sitting next to him. And he said, son, he said, I think my next step is going to be the graveyard. And, and I said, dad, don't, don't talk like that. I said, yeah. we can't give up. you know, we just can't give up. Please don't say things like that. And <laughs> trying to hold back the tears. And he looked at me. And I'll say this, that up until that moment, um, my dad would always, if I would tell him, dad, I love you, he would like speak of himself in the third person. He'd say, dad loves you. you know? Yeah. Say, I love you, dad. He'd say, well, dad loves you. This was the first time when he, when I'm sitting on his bed with him that he looked at me and he put his hand on my, on my knee and he said, Jeff he said, I love you. Mm-hmm. And, um, that's the first time you said it like that in my entire life, you know. That's a big thing for that generation, right? <laughs> Dad was born in 1937. And yeah, so for him to just say it, that was the big thing. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I, I talked to you about, you know, my, all of all of his side of the family is from Newfoundland, Canada. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and he was from this small town called Buren, which to this day is still a small town. And, mm-hmm. You know, my dad came from a time where, you know, the house was heated with a wood burning stove and you had to go out to the well to get your water. And he'd, he'd say, I'd have to bring something to break the ice so I could get well out of the water, you know. So so dad came from some tough times, you know, like yeah. you said. And, and when he finally said that, I just, it, you know, I wouldn't trade that moment for anything. But he told me, he said, if something happens to me, son, he, he points to this this, <laughs> this trash bag he had in the corner of the room. He said, there's some papers in there. He said, where there's some money I have in an old account from the government. And he says, if I pass away, if I die, he says, call the number on there. And he says, they'll tell you how you get this money. And I'm like, dad, I don't want your money. You know, mm-hmm. I, don't want this. You know I just want you. And But it's it's just interesting that, you know, maybe he somehow knew it was coming, you know. You never know. Yeah, but but he did. He passed away. And um, so once we got all that, you know, past his funeral arrangements and everything and, and got him cremated, um, I remembered that conversation. And I looked at these trash bags and, and sure enough, found the number. And, you know, a couple months go by. And the job I had at the time, I had this great boss that knew my circumstances, knew I was taking care of my dad. And when I called him and told him dad had passed away, he said, you know what, Jeff? He says, I'm giving you permission to, to take a leave of absence. And he said, work will be here. He says, you, you call me and tell me when you're ready to come back. Yeah. He says, I, I don't even want you here right now. You know, you need to deal with this. 
and you know very nice of him um but i called this number and obviously was not was far away from god at that time you know i've i've told you my my whole story up until this point and i started smoking pot to medicate the hurt mm-hmm. you know? Uh, I mean, pot goes right to those endorphins and everything and fires off those chemicals in your brain where you just feel you feel good and you feel high and you feel happy. And when I would called this number and they got all the information I needed, you know, I think I remember asking them, OK, so I'm going to get all this money, da, 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 da. And I, I asked the lady, OK, she says, yes. And I said, OK, how much money am I getting? And she said, well, there's eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. And when you're in the state of mind that I was in, you don't need a large sum of money. No, coming your way. <laughs> no. And, you know, and I, I got it and I just went nuts and had a nice looking girlfriend at the time. I, you know, I'd take her everywhere and spoil her. And, and I think I spent thousands of dollars on, on weed and on drugs. And one night I, I, I'll never forget this. I was sitting in my apartment as the same apartment we lived in. And I just continued to live there. And I said, you know, all this hurt and all this confusion and with God, I've never been able to measure up. And, you know, they have convinced me that I'm going to hell. And I thought, you know, I'm done. If I'm going to go to hell, then I'm going to enjoy the trip. Yeah. I don't. And I, I, I kind of said it out loud in a whisper. I said, I just don't care. Yeah. And I made up my mind that I was going to indulge myself in every single thing that I wanted to indulge in. Every pleasure of the flesh, everything. And didn't care if I was a bad, if that meant being a bad person, didn't care if that meant hurting people, walking all over their feelings. So what, you know, I felt yeah. like it had been done to me so much that, that who cares? And, you know, I was, I was in my thirties. I was, I worked out at, at the time a lot. I was in, you know, in pretty decent shape. And I, there was this bar I would go to at times and they were looking for a bouncer and I thought, you know, that would be that would be something I'd be interested in, you know, um, because I'd, I'd be capable of offering some kind of protection to the patrons and I'd have a reason to deal with jerks and, you know, and get some of that frustration out. <laughs> right. And, you know, and I thought, what better way to, you know, that my thinking at the time, what better way to test yourself as a man it, and getting these big confrontations with other men. (laughs) Whatever works. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, that's where my mind was at. And, and, and I did, and, and I just totally embraced evil. And I remember just being so consumed by it. And, you know, you can, you can just give yourself over to those kind of feelings and emotions. And, and and I think there's a spiritual element involved with it too. You know, yeah. there is evil in this world and it's not coming from God. I mean, right. And, you know, um, it, God has changed me so much. And, and I'll get to the good part. That is the good part of the story in a moment that I, I am not recognizable for the person compared to the person I was in the mid 2000s. I've got pictures I could show you. I didn't keep too many. Um, the whole look in my eyes was was different back then. And, mm-hmm. You know, and the people have, when I've told my story, gotten curious, you know, some people have, especially the younger guys. Well, did you get in fights and stuff when you were a bouncer? And there was a couple, but I had this demeanor um, and this whole vibe about me that, that just people didn't want to mess with. And um, I remember I was friends with the DJ at the bar I worked at when I took this bouncer job. And we were sitting out there. The shift started at nine o'clock, not just for me, but for the DJ too. And we're sitting in the in the car, in my car out in front of the bar. And they had this little bench, this metal bench up right outside of it. And there's this young guy standing there and something about him just annoyed me. I don't know what it was. It's <laughs> so petty and stupid. And I looked at 
that my friend, the DJ, and I said, watch this. I says, I'm going to look at this guy and scare him and he's going to walk away. And my friend just raised an eyebrow at me. And I just deliberately looked at this guy and he makes eye contact with me. And I just looked at him and stared him down. And sure enough, he just walked away. And my friend in the car said, you are scaring me. And I just I just laughed about it. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, that I, could I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> oh, I, I could look at people and scare them to death. I thought it was great. <laughs> you know, and and that was part of my technique as a bouncer. And while there were some some hands-on situations, mm -hmm. most of the time I found I could just scare people and intimidate them without that. And there's one friend I have, you know, now he's he's Christian too. Now he wasn't at the time, but he said, Man, even back then, Jeff, he says, I thought you were demon possessed or you were borderline <laughs> possessed. He said, because everybody was afraid of you, you know, and and God has changed me so much. I'm I'm 180 degrees from that now. And I, you know, I'd never want to be like that again. But but it was exciting at the time. And and I'm working in a bar and there's always there's always pretty women around. And mm -hmm. you know, when you're indulging in sin, I mean, yeah, you're gonna indulge in that too. And yeah, you know, and I I was a train wreck and boy, I'd get these women in my life that really liked me and I'd just I'd just I'd just wreck them, you know. And and I knew I was doing it. I knew I was being so destructive, but you know, we would it would get messy and break up after a few months, and I would think in my head, well. The next one won't know anything about me, so I can play the same game with her until she sees through my my, <laughs> my stuff. And you know, <laughs> and it's I mean it's it's funny, but it's not funny, right? Because, you know, there was a lot of hurt involved, and I I just did that over and over and over. And within a few years, my lifestyle started to catch up to me, and I met this lady, real sweetheart of a woman. We're we're in touch to this day, and at one point had asked her to marry me, but I was such a train wreck that she didn't. And it's, it's good that she didn't at the time. Cause I heard her enough, <laughs> but um, I told her, and I think I brought this up to you last month when we initially talked, I said, you know, I want to get involved in a, in an outlaw motorcycle program, you know, something like the hell's angels. You know, that's, I said, because when those guys show up, their reputation precedes them. And, and I thought, you know, nobody messes with these guys. And I would fit right in. And she said to me, she said, you know, if you do that, she says, I don't think I can be with you. And, mm. and I, you know, I really thought that over and I was in love with her at the time. And I finally talked to her. I said, you know what? I said, okay. I said, you're more important to me than that. So, you know. So she might have saved your life. Yeah. And you said that to me a month ago, too. She probably yeah. did because those guys, yeah. a lot of them either wind up in prison or they're dead. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sin has an allure, but it also has a payday. Sure. Yeah. And and there was little things that happened. I mean, one weekend uh, I was scheduled to work at the bar and I, I asked for it off. And the, the bar owner gave me that time off. And there was a young man that went in there and the bouncers threw him out for something that he did. And he came back with a pistol and started shooting in the bar and he killed someone that didn't have anything to do with the altercation. Oh my goodness. And if I had gone to work, I would have, I would have been one of the bouncers there that night. So, so you never know. Um, I don't. But, um, you know, the, the lifestyle, like you said, the payday finally came and it started to take a toll on me um, emotionally and in my life. I mean, things just got messy in every single way financially i mean i <laughs> in 2006 the only time i wasn't stoned was when i was asleep and i got in my car one day and me and me and sue had these two dogs and and i love dogs i love spending time with dogs i love training them you know i read a lot of books about that and that was one of my favorite pastimes was training and spending time with the dogs and my dog had done so good at one point. I was really proud of his progress. And I was going to Petco. I don't know if they have Petco up there, but it's one of these big sure. stores. Or these chain pet pets, stores. But I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to get him some dog treats. And I was high as a kite when I walked in there. <laughs> and my dog's name was Harley. And I'm getting, I'm picking out these treats for Harley. And I'm 
walking through the parking lot, just stoned. And I'm like, man, I'm going to drive back to the house, give the dog these treats. And so I get in my car and I'm, I put in a CD and uh, I start creeping. I put the car in drive and I start creeping and I give it a little bit of gas and then boom, there's this sudden stop. And I ran into a light pole that was totally obvious in the parking lot. And, you know, and I'm stoned out of my head and I'm, and I'm like, well, this is going to be fun to explain to my girlfriend. <laughs> Probably a good thing. It kept you off the road, though. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, totaled the car, um, you know, and and there's just several things that, like you said, begin to happen where the where you start getting where you start reaping the consequences of what you did. Sue and I eventually split up. And um, we're good friends this day, but, you know, she's she's in a relationship with someone else and she's very happy and I'm happy for her. But she was she tried to help me. Uh, she was one of these women that tried to save me. And, and some women mm-hmm. do that, try to save a man. And, you know, and the man can't be saved, not by her. at least. Well, you have to want to save yourself. You can't fix anybody else. Right. Yeah. And. You know, we split up and the consequences start hitting me and my of my lifestyle. And there was all kinds of things I don't have time to get into. It's you know, you mentioned I mentioned getting locked up and it and I've I've been arrested and gone to jail and stuff. And it is actually a miracle that I'm not in prison because I did a lot of things that, that could have sent me to prison. And, mm-hmm. you know, I thought I was being clever or whatever. Um, but you know, I think if I'd have kept playing the game, it would have happened at some point. You know, so in in 2008, she and I started to split up. And um, again, I'm like, I need help. I need to change. And again, I go back to the UPC. And, you know, I, I've thought about somebody's going to watch this and say, well, you were just back and forth, back and forth. You just love the world. No, it wasn't so much that as that I had had so much rejection and so much confusion that um and it felt hopeless Mm -hmm. that i you know i i couldn't go back there and it felt like i couldn't go anywhere else and in my hopelessness it wasn't so much that i loved the world it just felt like there was no other place to go right and i wound up where i said well if this is it and this is just my destiny that i'm going to be lost then and i'll just embrace it until i die And um, when I went back this time, I, you know, I, I still had some of that. Okay. I'm going to try as hard as I can do as much as I can again. And um, there was, you know, there was other things I began to notice that just, that were just off. And this church I went to this pastor one night, he was, this was kind of the final, the final straw for me in the UPC where he was preaching one night and he quoted out of Hebrews where it talks about forsake, not the assembling of yourselves together. And, you know, so much, the more you see the day approaching. And if we continue to sin after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. And he ties all that together. And he says, I have studied this. And he says, this is what I've concluded. He says that if you're not in church, every time the doors open, you're jeopardizing your salvation. And I thought about that sitting there and I thought, you know, I'm a Bible college dropout, man. And I know that's not what that verse means. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. You know, and and not that we shouldn't go to church. I go to church now, but I, you know, my my salvation isn't dependent on getting there. The door opens. Well, and it's a good thing because, you know, things can happen. Pandemics right ptsd chronic that health issues person. you know yeah. a person never knows and so your salvation is not tied to church attendance in a building it's tied to christ sure yeah and I, I mean i love I, you know i go to a non-denominational church now and i love going there but but it's like jesus says that the sabbath was created for man man wasn't created for the sabbath right yeah, <laughs> you know we're gonna we're gonna make another another rule, another requirement, another rule, and and throw another rock on everyone's back, and, you know, yeah, as if they're not carrying enough, right? Um, 
And so after that experience, I left and I did go to a, a, a non-denominational church and it felt good, but I just wasn't ready to trust it. Yeah. At that time. I wanted to, but I wasn't ready. And I, I didn't live so destructive anymore, but all of the consequences, like I said, of my lifestyle for so many years just began to hit me and were weighing so heavy on me. And I just sank into this depression. And it lasted about nine years. Mm. And it got so bad that I couldn't even concentrate. Um, it's a long time to be battling depression. Yeah. Um, you know, and... I was diagnosed with it professionally by both a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And, you know, one of them told me, um, you know, you don't you don't just have depression, Mr. Mayo. You have depression and anxiety. You're just kind of sandwiched between the two of those and yeah. and prescribed me, you know, Xanax and something else. And I was taking that and that didn't help. I mean, the pills don't help. They just, you know, they don't solve your problem. I think it can be part of the recovery process I'm yeah. not, i wouldn't tell anybody not to take medication stabilize you, you enough to the point where you can start to work through some things till you get some healing but yeah, yeah. not the answer answer yeah. yeah for me though and i'm not saying this is the case for everybody for me all it did was just numb me up and i lived like that for about nine years and the only time i could find peace was was when i was asleep and i, I would you know, I recall going to sleep every night thinking maybe I'll wake up in the morning and I'll feel different. And I'd wake up every morning and the same the same monkey was on my back. Yeah. And, you know, for nine years and you get to where, like I said, for me, I couldn't concentrate on anything for long periods of time. And that is one of the symptoms of, of severe depression. And I could read something and not be able to tell you what I read. I could watch yeah. a movie and not be able to tell you what I watched you know and and people would think that was weird you know hey do you, you know asking me about a movie what do you think about this this and this part of the movie well i'd kind of nod my head but <laughs> i got it <laughs> yeah so and you know and it affects every aspect of your life when it's that bad and i would i would start one job with the full intent and, and motivation of of doing well and i couldn't mm -hmm. concentrate i'd make some stupid mistake and get myself fired and so this went on, like I said, nine years. And in 2018, I worked in this um, in this steel fabrication place that uh, you know that was a, an ag an agriculture fabricating place that built stuff for the almond industry. And they'd have me do different jobs there. And um, they finally trusted me enough after a couple of years to let me run the metal saw because the guy that was running it he had retired. And I would intermittently run it. And I thought, hey, you know, it's just the metal saw. If I pay attention to the to the measurements and the angles and everything, you know, that we're supposed to cut, I'll be okay. But again, it was so depressed, it interfered with it. Mm -hmm. And I'd made a couple mistakes and the shop foreman was, you know, the, the men that work in that kind of business, I mean, they, these are some tough dudes, you know, and 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 they don't they don't take kindly to stupid mistakes and and yeah. crap like that and, you know you'll get yourself yelled at it at the mm -hmm. very minimum and i you know i got a lot of that and one day you know this guy's name was james this foreman he comes to me and he says jeff he says we've got this stainless steel tube coming in. he said and i'm going to give you the specs to cut it now in its raw state he says this piece of material costs eighteen thousand dollars and he says, you cannot mess this up. And he says, before you cut, he says, you need to check everything on the saw, make sure everything's lined up at the right angle. And then you start your cut. So I'm kind of nervous and kind of scared, but I thought I checked everything. And, you know, this part of it, it's it was kind of not not 100% my fault, but I could have been paying more attention. But there was a a spot in the back of the saw, one of the knobs had been broken. And the way, the only way to stabilize it was to get back there with a big pair of vice grips and clamp it down. And they just never fixed it, you know. But as long as you clamped it down right, it, you know, it was, it was supposed to stay there. And most of the time it did. 
So I, I turn the saw on and I start this cut and I'm watching it go into this, this big piece of stainless steel and it, it, it looks good. It looks good. And it, we're going a couple inches in and I'm thinking, man, I'm fine. You know, I can just kind of turn around and look at something else. And I'm looking away for about five minutes and the vice grip had slipped in the back by about two degrees and I could see it starting to drift <laughs> and I got scared to death and there's an emergency stop button on it. So I slam my hand down on that and I go run into the front office and I tell James what happened. And, uh, you know, he just, his eyes get real big and he walks back there with me and he looks at me and he looks at the piece of material and he goes, Jeff, he says, I don't know what to do with you. I don't want to fire you. But he says, you put me in a pickle. He says, I don't know what to do with you. Do you know what I should do with you? And this is a guy who's most of the time yelling at you. <laughs> he, he was so upset he couldn't even yell at me. <laughs> and I felt so hurt and so humiliated. And, you know, you can't tell your employer that, you know, I've well, man, I've got severe depression. That doesn't matter to him in that situation, you know. And so... They figured out a way between him and the general manager, they figured out a way to make it work. And I went home that day and was so defeated. And I walked into the bedroom and I hadn't prayed in about nine years. And this is where the story starts to get better. Um, and I shut the door of the bedroom and I looked up at the ceiling like I was just looking at God. And I said something like, Lord, I said, I know I haven't talked to you in many, many years said, I don't even know what to say, but I want to come home. And I said, I don't know where home is either. But I said, if you'll have me, would you just let me come back? And began to cry for about 30 minutes. And it was the kind of cries where you're just having those big sobs. And my whole body is just shaking. And that was all I could do. And, you know, the snot's going everywhere. The tears going everywhere. And um, it went on for about half an hour. I couldn't find any words. And I stopped to breathe after about half an hour. And I just, I heard it like a whisper, like they talk about the still small voice of God. And it was like God was saying to me, you're forgiven. And I just was so focused on those words. I could hear it somewhere inside me. And I looked up at the ceiling again and I said, really, God, really? You, you'll forgive me? And it was like an echo. And it was like the Lord just telling me again, you're forgiven. And I just, I, I, I kept saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm just crying and, and you know, saying things like, I love you, God. Thank you, God. I love you. And when I caught my breath again, I said, Lord, I want to go to church. And I said, but please don't make me go back to the UPC. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, you know what I have learned about that, Lord. And I said, if if I have to, I have to. But I said, if there's another way, I said, please show it to me. Please help me. And I said, I, if you can put... Christian men in my life is what I said. If you can put Christian men in my life that can help me and show me the way out, and show me the way back, then please do that. And I found this this video on uh, on YouTube totally by accident by this man named Jeff Harkin. He wrote this book I shared with you before called Grace Plus Nothing, and he talks about it over about a thirty minute message. In and he, he's talking about grace and it turns out he had a similar experience as mine with with legalism where he was just trying to fix himself in his early christianity and it drove him insane um he wound up in a hospital almost died and he said you know while he was there god started showing him grace and what grace was in the scripture started changing his life and, you know, he's he used to live in California. I think he's in Kentucky now, but he's he's a pastor. It's a great book. And, you know, I'd recommend it to to any Christian. I have said no matter how whether you're new in Christ or whether you've been walking with God for many years, it's, it's a great book about grace. But it, he you know, hearing him talk about it, that that gave me some hope. And there's a man that um, 
was connected to this church in Stockton for several years, and he taught at the Bible College. And I know him well enough to know that that he won't mind me bringing up his name. His name is Jeff Garner, and okay. he's con- yeah, he's connected to the Haney family up here. And I knew that Jeff had left in 2002, and I didn't know why. I didn't know what he was up to, but I knew he had left. And I looked on my Facebook that night and saw that he was still in my friends. At some point, I had I had requested him as a Facebook friend. And so I got on Messenger there. I clicked on the Messenger part on his profile. And I said, hey, Jeff, I don't know if you remember me. I said, I was one of your students. I said, you actually visited my dad when he was in the hospital. And I said, I just... I need some help. And I told him everything that had just happened where I'm, you know, on the floor on my knees crying. And I said, I understand that you left the UPC. And I said, you know, can you just help me? Can you talk to me? Can And I, I ended it with that. I said, can you help? And I didn't hear from him for about 12 hours. And it was so neat. I, I came in from work, I think the next day. And I saw the message there. And Jeff had wrote me back in all caps. He said, I can help. Yeah. And he said, said, when can you talk to me? And I said, well, man, just tell me how to get a hold of you. I'll talk to you right now. And Jeff was so kind. And, you know, it turns out that he was pursuing his his doctorate degree in theology at at a seminary out here. And he had started to see the flaws in the UPC doctrine while he was in seminary. And as immersed as he was, you know, he used to go out with the college choir and and travel and and preach while the choir would sing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember him telling me the story that, you know, that that year in 2002, that the college had unanimously voted him in to be the next college president. And he was telling me, he said, you know, I, I just, in light of what I saw, he said, I couldn't do it. And he met with the man that was then the president of the college. And he said, look, here's what's going on. He says, I just cannot in good conscience stay here because I don't see this anymore. And he says, I will finish up my classes. But he says, once the school year is over, he says, I'm taking a pastorate in San Francisco and I'm leaving. And, you know, Jeff told me the moment where he started to see grace, where he started to see how simple it was to, to be saved. Mm-hmm. He said that was it was when he was at seminary and he told me this story about how in the chapel in the seminary, he said one day he crawled under one of the pews and he said he cried for five hours. He saw grace and he knew what it was going to cost him. He knew it was going to have to leave. Yeah. Uh, and Jeff helped me so much. We would talk every Tuesday. We'd meet on Zoom like this. And I would ask him every question I could think of, you know, why? Why do we baptize in Jesus name? <laughs> why do we believe in one god and other people don't and, you know and mm-hmm. jeff was so patient because he'd already been through it he right and explain it to me and the other man i found was in a group that you and me are both in called departing mm-hmm. and the man that started that group pastor buddy martin out in louisiana yeah um, he left the upc in the early 70s and he's been he's been counseling former former Pentecostals for years. And he was the other one that just came into my life. And and I asked God to do that for me. And God answered my prayer and sent me those two. Mm-hmm. They, they unwound it. And it took me, you know, God started to work on me that night in March 2018. And it took me about a year of, you know, of unwinding everything before I was in my right mind. But it was... And I had been so removed from the scripture and everything, but I would come home from work and I'd sit down and put on some worship music and I'd just talk to God from my heart. And there was no church. There was nothing like that. Didn't didn't go to church to, for several months until I found one. But God would just come and the spirit would just come and he would just love me. You know, and I, I understood that this is by grace through faith. And of course you receive the Holy Spirit. Um, You know, Jesus said that. And and the birth of the water and the Spirit, when you really study that out of John chapter 3, he's not talking about baptism and 
Nicodemus wouldn't have thought he was talking about baptism. Um, there are so many places in the scripture where the spirit is like water and water is like the spirit. And Jesus is using it as an illustration, you know, and I know you know this. I'm, I'm saying this maybe to somebody that's watching that's thought, thought about this. But you look at John chapter seven, where he says, if you he that believes on me as the scripture has said, well, the only scripture at that time was the Old Testament. Right. So Jesus is saying, if you just believe that I'm the Messiah, if you believe I'm the son of God, that I'm the way, the truth and the life, mm -hmm. he's saying from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Well, we understand he wasn't talking about turning on a water spigot and, right. and water is going to start coming out of you. And John even says that this, he spoke of the spirit, mm -hmm. right? That they that receive, that believe on him should receive. But John says the Holy Ghost wasn't given because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. But the plan, and Jesus is saying it there, the plan is always putting faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And when you truly put faith in Christ and you surrender, you know, and trust him for salvation and, and nothing else, not your denomination, not your religion, not what your pastor said, but what Jesus said, then you're saved. Yeah. If it's genuine, if your faith is genuine, then you're saved and you receive the Holy Spirit. And as far as speaking in tongues, I mean, there are times when I'm deep in prayer and worship, I still experience that. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt that it happens. But I think I said this early on in this interview. I know so many Christians that have never spoken in tongues, but they manifest the, 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 the work of the Spirit in their life. You see it in their life. You, you hear it when they talk to you. Yeah. It's just there. Um, you know, and, and, this fear of that if you're going to leave, God is going to strike you dead and something horrible is going to happen to you. I mean, I I don't see that. It's spiritual terrorism. I think it's one of the worst things that UPC people do to their saints. Mm -hmm. it, it holds them hostage there. So no matter what goes wrong, it, like you've basically completely destroyed any other opportunity outside of what you're offering. Yeah, very well said. I think it's terrible. It is. It's it, it, such a such a culture of fear, and you know, perfect love casts out fear. And I used to read that scripture like it was like it was on my side of the fence that I had to have perfect love. But it's talking about God's perfect Christ, love. Yeah. and and God doesn't want us to be afraid of Him, you know. And all the things that we could be afraid of, Jesus already took care of on the cross. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so because Christ absorbed all of our punishment for sin, we don't have to be afraid of God. And that's that's just beautiful. You know, I can come and talk to God and, and I'm welcome. Yes. But yeah, it just it's it I slowly started to heal and some things are still healing because I lived for twenty years out in sin and wreckage, you know, and and there's other things that God is is correcting, you know, there's bad habits that you know, that don't dominate my life anymore, but they come up every now and then. And yeah. that's that's just part of the sanctification. I think we've all got that if oh, we're yeah. truly following Christ. But, you know, my message I would say to anyone, because I know there's other people out there like this, if you think you've gone too far and you think that, you know, that you can't be redeemed anymore, if you think your life is just a total mess and God's not going to save you, I, I don't believe that. Because if God could save me in the total wreck of a life that I had, then he could save anybody. We're never too um, far gone. No, no. And, and I think that's ridiculous. And they draw these lines that there's like some threshold you can cross that, you know, that, hey, there's no coming back from. Yeah. And I, you know, I, maybe there is, I don't see it though. And, and I deliberately tried to cross it <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and God still had mercy on me. So. Yeah, I, I, I just don't see that. You know, you're it's not hopeless. You're not too far gone. There's still hope. God still loves you. And if you come back to Jesus and ask him to forgive you, he will. And, you yeah. know, and there's and if you've been away for a while, sure, there's some healing that has to take place. Um, you know, I wanted to say when I finally did go to church, it was it was so different from UPC. I mean, there's a coffee shop built in the church. And okay. You see people walking around with cups of coffee, and I thought that was weird. And you know, people eating donuts mm -hmm. in the sanctuary, and, 
you know, and I thought, man, are, you just, you, are they supposed to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Is this allowed? <laughs> but I remember the first time I went there, you know, they start the worship music and I could feel the presence of God as much as I did in any UPC church. And there wasn't all this wild activity going around, but you see people raising their hands. You see people with tears running down their cheeks and, and you could feel God's presence there. And I kind of smiled the first time I went and I said, God, what are you doing here? I said, you're not supposed <laughs> to be here. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> but but he was, and you know, I've discovered that in any church, there's people that are that are on the fringes mm-hmm. that, that aren't really, you know, I guess in it like they could be. There's people that are that are all in, and there's people somewhere in the middle, and that you know that has less to do with denomination. It's just people. I mean, right. you know, you've got to decide how close you want to be with God. Yeah, but you know to. To say to say that somebody's saved or they're not saved, I don't do that anymore. That's God's business. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you how to be saved, but after that, I, I can't tell you whether you are or not. Um, so yeah, and you know, um, about a year after I got I got baptized again. Not mm-hmm. that I had to so much, but when I was thirteen, I didn't understand what I was doing. Right. You know, and now I. I more fully understood what it was about and why we did it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the same man, Jeff Garner, he baptized me the second time and I had a full understanding of what was taking place. But, you know, uh, we're, we're saved by grace. I mean, uh, there's so many things that Paul taught that, po- that points to that in the book of Romans and in the, in the book of Galatians. You know, Paul is talking about that too, just over and over. And, you know, it, I think he's, it's him that says at one point, if, you know, if it's grace plus works, then it's no more grace. Again, that's what Jeff Harkin gets at in this book. It's why it's grace plus nothing. There's nothing else. And in that, you know, in that uh, message that teaching he did on YouTube that I talked about, you know, he says, everywhere I go, he says, people look at me like I'm kind of crazy. He says, I'm sort of used to it. And he says, they tell me that well, I know we're saved by grace, but, and he says, hey, if you put a butt in on it, if you put a butt on it, I'm out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's just grace or it's nothing. Um, mm-hmm. so, well, it's grace or it's nothing, no matter how hard you try, because we're all just still people and we're right. going to mess it up. That's the only sure thing. The sure thing is we're going to mess it up. So either he did it all or we're doomed. That's Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> <laughs> so, spiritually, you landed in the grace of God, right? Yeah, right. And, and you know, to to from a place where so many people told me I was doomed, mm-hmm. I believed at one point I was doomed myself. Yeah. And when I went running back to God, He was right there. Mm-hmm. And and when I did, there was really no other place to go but God, but he was right there. And, you know, one of my favorite passages of scripture has become where Jesus in Luke chapter four, there's the record of him walking back into the synagogue that he grew up in. And he takes that scroll and reads from Isaiah. And he says that one of the things he came to do was to bind up the brokenhearted. Yeah, and I mean, that's me. Because I was so broken. And, you know, I will I will still have those moments where I'll just get alone with God. It doesn't have to be in a church. And I will thank him that he has healed my heart and he has bound it back up. And there are still some things that are that are being healed. And, you know, and I hate sometimes that I lost so many years. Yeah. And, you know, I wish we had these groups that we found, you know, back in the 90s. <laughs> Yeah, me too. I could. Yeah, imagine. but but we have them now, and um, the World Wide Web and the Internet has has allowed us to you know expose some of this dangerous stuff, and not not for the not for the reason of revenge or out of bitterness, but but extending hope to people. Right. Exactly. And so I guess my last question would be, and I ask this to everybody. 
And it kind of piggybacks on what you just said about you feel sad when you think about the lost years. But I would ask you, like, do you harbor any bitterness towards the UPC or what you were taught or the just kind of the whole situation? Because we are called bitter. A lot of times anybody who speaks out, if you have any critique at all, (laughs) like, well, you're just bitter. (laughs) So are Um, you bitter? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. No, it. And, and to be honest with you, it's never been bitterness. Um, mm-hmm. There was there was times, you know, it's been almost six years now that, that God has had me on the road to recovery and yeah. reconciliation to him. There was times I've been angry. Mm-hmm. And, and I hear some people's story that, you know, that experienced the some similar things that I have with the condemnation, with the, with the heaps of guilt. That makes me angry that that still happens. But I Same. think that's different than bitterness. You know, it's mm-hmm. just anger that, that because it doesn't have to be that way. Right. You know, so so no bitterness. No, there's there's moments of anger. There's moments where, where I felt hurt, but I was never bitter. Um, you know, I think a lot of them don't know any better. And there was a time I didn't know any better because I've said – when I was much younger, I said some of the same same things too, you know. Oh, they just want to go out and live in the world and live in sin. And I I have I have met maybe two or three people over the last three years where or the last six years where that was the case. Yeah. But you know, people like yourself, people I've met in these other groups, ninety nine percent of them don't want to just go and be big sinners. No, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, they're just looking for for love and they're looking for grace and mercy. They're looking for the Jesus that offers that. I really appreciate you being willing to come on and and share your story and just being so open and honest about everything. I think uh, Jonah and I talked about this uh, too in in the last interview was just sometimes Christians take so much time pretending they're perfect and hiding their struggles because you feel like, well, you know, if I'm a Christian, I shouldn't have these struggles. And so when you got a whole group of people pretending they got no problems, it's not a good thing because it makes other people feel like, well, I don't fit with these perfect people. I'm over here. I'm a mess. And, you know, and, and I think it discourages people. And so I think it takes a lot of courage to be open and honest about experiences and mistakes and stuff, but I think it gives hope. It shines a light Mm -hmm. to other people. And I want to say, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think you open up the comments in these videos, do you? Oh, yeah. I just, it's the wild, wild west down there sometimes. But I, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if anybody sees that, you know, I, I have been, I have been removed from the UPC entirely since about 2009. And, um, and I've been away from Denver for, geez, I'm, you know, close to 30 years. But, you know, I think if somebody sees this and you recognize me and you remember me from the old days and if you want to talk to me, you know, you can put it in the comments and I'll be glad to talk to you. I mean, as long as you're not going to try to persuade me to come back. I mean, <laughs> As long as it's not know. an evangel or a missionary journey that you're, yeah, you're yeah. Gonna bring me back to the fold. Right. You know, uh, because I've already been down that road, but I mean, I'll talk to anybody and yeah. you know, if, if something I said has helped you and you want to talk to me, send a message there and I'll, I'll tell you how to get a hold of me. And I, I certainly don't have all the answers, but maybe I can point you in the right direction. Well, if you enjoyed this video, you can hit like, and you can share it and you can hit subscribe and the little notification bell if you want YouTube to let you know whenever I post a new video and they will do that. So Jeff, again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Deanna. I, I, I came across your channel about four years ago and, and watched some things then and I was like, I was kind of new to this then and I was like, this lady gets it. Who is this lady? You know, so I'm glad I'm glad I finally got to meet you. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I'm really glad we could do this. I hope everyone has a great night. All right. Bye-bye, Deanna.